All right, so let's let's start class. So we ended that communication between neurons. I hope the class can hear me. Yes. Yes, my yes, And just to remind you that you have a, a miss uh, Wednesday, right? Is this Wednesday, right? Class. Hello. 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 Oh, madam. Please, it's when? It's Wednesday, right? That's uh, from what you decided on. Godfrey. Godfrey. Please, when are you writing the exams? No, we are not told you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, madam. Hi, sister. Oh, please. Hey. Uh, we decided on the day. We all are... is it my network or yeah, sister, it's like your network is not good. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Please, yes. yes. So, when well, you are writing your midterm on Wednesday, okay. I don't know, it's only that part that you are not hearing. Maybe you don't want to write the exam. So, you are, you are writing the, the exam uh -huh. on Wednesday. So, okay. Um, the time, the time should be favorable to everyone. So I'll wait on you to bring me the time that you want to write. Okay, because I don't want the situation whereby you give me excuses that that prevented you from taking part. In between neurons, we've done, we've we've done the introductory part of the nervous system and so on, the division the organizations and then the functions of the nervous system. So you want to look at um, how neurons communicate. So we mentioned the functions of the neuron as um, transmission of in impulse or information in the body. So we want to look at how this impulse crosses one neuron to the other. So just from the, the 
background picture that you see, we have one neuron and then the second neuron. And you can see that an impulse is being transmitted from one neuron or the first neuron to the second neuron. And we are saying that we want to look at how this information or impulse is transmitted and also how it crosses um, the space or the synapse to the second and neuron. So we are saying, we are also um, looking at the fact that there is a, a gap or a space between the, the neurons, okay? So they are not attached to each other directly, but there's a gap or space between them. And that space is the synapse or synaptic link. Okay, and we will also look at how the impulse will be transmitted from the axon terminal to then the following or the, the next um, neuron. So we are saying how do neurons talk to each other or basically how do transmission of impulse occur between two neurons. We are saying all that we are trying to mean is that we are, we want to transmit impulses from one neuron to the other. And before that can happen, there need to be the liberation of some molecules called the neurotransmitters. And it's these neurotransmitters that will trigger the second neuron to continue the transmission of impulse. So you are saying communication is by the liberation of signal molecules like hormones, neurotransmitters. We have different kinds of hormones and different kinds of neurotransmitters and what they do in terms of transmission of impulse, a particular impulse. So you are saying signal molecules initiate their action by binding to receptors and generating a response. So all that you are saying is that when an impulse is traveling from this neuron to the second neuron, you are saying we have neurotransmitters that will be released from neuron one into the space. And these neuro, um, neurotransmitters will bind to their receptors on neuron two. Okay, these receptors are proteins found in the cell membrane of the um, neuron. So we, when we are doing the introductory part, we did the structure of the cell membrane the different kinds of proteins we have and all that. And we mentioned that the, some of the proteins are receptors. The receptors are there to bind to a particular ligand or chemical. And here, the ligand or chemical is the neurotransmitter. So example, acetylcholine will bind to its respective um, receptor and then it will continue the transmission of impulse in your two. They're saying communication may be from nerve cell to nerve cell, from nerve cell to muscle, or from nerve to nerve cell to plant. So before that, let me ask the class um, this question. We have already done transport mechanisms. So from the picture you see on your right, what kind of transport mechanism does these neurotransmitters um, move from the axon terminal of neuron one into the sinus. I'll take the question again. What type of transport mechanism does these neurotransmitters move into the space or the sinus? Anyone from the class? Yes, Martin. Adam is a uh, passive transport. Passive? Why passive? Because it has no need any uh, energy uh, to transfer uh, to cross the cell memory. It's uh, it's been uh, exchanged by uh, ion signals. Okay. Um. Uh, I won't take that. Let me take the question again. Martin, you come again. So Martin, please. Um, I hope you can see my slide. Martin. Yes, please. Yes. So 
the, the neuron one. You can see we have these neurotransmitters in an orange color in a vesicle, right? In vesicles. Can you see that? Yes, please. Yes, so I'm asking how they move from the axon terminal here into the synapse, as you see. How? Which transport mechanism? Martin. Sister, please. Okay. So think about it. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. Think about it. It's not passive transport. It's not passive transport. I hope you are ready for the message. Mm, okay. So Martin, I'll get back to you. Think about it. So let me take another submission. Imoro. Imoro. Please, madam, I think it's facilitated. Facilitated. Why? Yes, madam. Why? I can see that some this thing is carrying them into the other nerves. It's like some particular this thing is carrying them. Some facilitator is carrying the group of transmission into the other one. Okay. Okay. Um, I won't take that. It's not facilitated. Tomorrow you come again, think about it carefully and come again. Yes, Daniel. Yes, um, madam, I think it's uh, active transport. Because it's, um, it's active transport. Okay, why? Because the, the molecules are in the neuron one, that is the first uh, neuron where they are transmitted. Um, the molecules over there, they, 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 they go across they have to, uh, to cross the. Uh, they have to gain polarity. That's okay. they need energy in order to uh, cross that particular gap, in order to be able to carry the the information or the coded information across uh, the gap to the next neuron. Okay, and uh, Daniel, I'll give you five out of ten. Okay, five out of ten. You are not wrong, but uh, whenever you are asked, as you are going to write the exams, okay, whenever you are asked about a type of transport for a particular um, movement or particular yeah, particular transport, please be specific. When you say active transport, we have types, okay, and I'm sure we did all that before we moved to this lesson. So which exact type or which specific type of active transport does this movement of neurotransmitters use? So when I ask you in exams or wherever that you find yourself, just be specific because we have different types of active transport. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone? Anyone, Daniel, would you like to come again? Martin, are you ready? Martin. Madam. Yes, would you like to come again? Oh, I should move on. I move on. Okay, Martin. Moment, moment, that's it, oh. Okay. Yes, it's, it's yeah. moving. Moving, okay. Yeah, madam, it's through, yeah, it's through diffusion. Why diffusion? Because if you look at the pictorial, there's, an, there's movement of molecules from the region on top, which is concentrated, then down to the lower gradient of the, the, the picture. So that makes it diffusion. Okay, moment, I won't take that, I won't take that. Diffusion is under passive transport. And with diffusion, we said we are moving molecules, yes, of molecules. from high concentration to a, high, a lower concentration. A low concentration, but, yeah. Yes, but they are not in vesicles, as you see. These are vesicles, okay. And we have the neurotransmitters, we have one, two, three, four, five, in one, vesicle we have another five in one another six this is six in one so we are carrying the neurotransmitters in bulk 
Okay, so if it were to be one, one, fine, it can be diffusion moving from higher to lower concentration. But here we are moving the neurotransmitters in both. Moment. I hope you get my explanation. Yes, please, madam. So not, Thank you. It's not passive. All right. I'll bet no, no, I, want to, I want to come again. Okay. Daniel, you want to come again? Yes, yes, please, madam. All right. You let me hear you. Okay. Um it is it is the uh summary. Daniel, can you come again? Please, uh, it is act primary active transport. Primary. Yes, please. Why? Because um, it uses uh, energy. That is, uh, it, it is in order to move the molecules across their uh, concentration gradient. That is, where they are highly concentrated to uh, the rich of their lower. Um, Daniel, I won't take that. I won't take that. Yes, it uses energy and it's under active transport, but it's not primary active transport. I gave a scenario with sodium this... potassium ATPs as um an example of primary active transport, where there's the direct use of ATP, ATP binding to the protein, the protein um carrier or pump with the use of ATP, three molecules of um, sodium is moving out and two molecules of potassium moving in against their concentration gradient. That's an example of um, act primary active transport. Look at the picture again. We are transporting neurotransmitters in bulk in a vesicle out of the cell to another cell. How better? Yes, yeah, it's just that it is actually an active transport and a vesicular, and it is exocytosis. Perfect, perfect. Exocytosis. So when I ask this question, the only answer I'm expecting is exocytosis. Exo. Exocytosis. Yes, it's under active transport. But when you write active transport, you have not really said anything, and therefore you don't get uh, your full mark. Okay, so it's exocytosis. So just to um, take us back to that part of transport, I'm sure a lot of you didn't get it. A lot of you didn't get it. Let me just go back and then show that part of the slide so that we all can appreciate. Um, Can you see my slide? No, please. Please, no. no. Okay. Can you see now? Yes. 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 So we have under tra active transport, you did transport in vesicles, right? We talked about endocytosis and exocytosis, right? Please, we, we did this, right? Yes. Yes, yes. And we talked of endocytosis. We are saying... With vesicular transport, we are moving substances in bulk, whether liquid or solid. And with the solid substances, sometimes they are very large, such that they can pass through the proteins, and therefore they need another mechanism to move them. So the picture you are seeing is an example of what I just showed you in the communication of uh, between neurons. Okay, so here we are moving, let's say these particles are neurotransmitters. 
Okay, so neurotransmitters, let me use the exocytosis as an example. So the neurotransmitters are outside, they are released from the outside and then they come inward. But here, um, let's say this is the inside, the intracellular of one neuron, that is neuron one. Okay, and you have the vesicle that uh, contains the neurotransmitters. So you want to move these neurotransmitters to the outside, to the synapse. Okay, and therefore you have this vesicle moving to fuse with the cell membrane and then eventually releasing the neurotransmitters. The reason why it's using exocytosis is because the neurotransmitters come in bulk. Okay, they come in bulk and therefore they can't um, pass through um, the cell membrane or they can't pass through the um, a carrier protein through the cell membrane. So whenever you hear vesicles, something is transported in a vesicle, just move straight to active transport. When you move straight to active transport, move straight to vesicular transport. So it's either it's moving out. If it's moving out, it's exocytosis. If it's coming in, it's endocytosis. I hope that is clear. Yes. Yes, madam. Yes, please. Yeah. So if this this were to be one of the questions, you just have about ten percent of you getting it right, which is bad. That means I'm not teaching well. Mm. Okay. So. As you move on, I'm sure there'll be series of um, transports break up. So let's take note. So we have vesicles inside the cell containing neurotransmitters. Uh, can you see the slide? I think I've not shared it. No, please. No, please. So you have vesicles inside this neuron as a cell, and then we have neurotransmitters inside these vesicles, and we are moving them out, and therefore that is exocytosis, exocytosis. So by exocytosis, these new neurotransmitters will move from neuron, neuron one to the synapse, and these neurotransmitters have their specific receptor on neuron two. And therefore, when they bind to it, it will continue the transmission of impulse. So you are saying the site of transmission of information or impulse is the synapse or the space that I just mentioned. And you have um, a typical synapse consisting of the presynaptic cell and then the postsynaptic cell. So Already we know that a neuron is a cell. So this neuron is a cell. So the neuron before the synapse is called presynaptic cell. And the neuron after the, the, the synapse is the post synaptic synaptic cell. So pre is before. So before the synapse. And then post is after, after the synapse. So neuron one is normally the presynaptic cell. The neuron two, the one receiving the impulse is post synaptic cell. And then we are saying synapse can be electrical found at gap junctions and also chemical found at the synaptic plate. So most of the synapse we find between neurons in the body are chemical. So the chemical there is because they transmit some chemicals across called um, neurotransmitters. So it's the chemicals that continue the transmission of impulse. That's why it's a chemical synapse. Electrical meaning we are still going to use the ions to transmit the impulse across the synapse or the, the gap junction. Okay, so just to better explain, you are saying the neuron one transmitting the impulse is the presynaptic neuron, and then the one receiving the, the impulse is the postsynaptic neuron. 
Between them, you have the synapse where there's release of neurotransmitters to continue the transmission of impulse. So you want to look at, aside the classification, whether electrical or chemical, we also want to look at some types of signals based on um, the type of cell they are written out. So the first one is the signals with another neuron. So one neuron sending an, an impulse to neuron, another neuron is the signals with another neuron. That is the common one we have been talking about since we started this class. And then we have the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction comes from the name neuron and the muscular. Neuron and the muscular. So neuron is transmitting an impulse or information to a muscle, a muscle cell. So muscle fiber is also known as muscle cell. So you can see that we have this neuron transmitting an information to this muscle, host muscle tissue. And then we also have the neuroglandular synapse. Neuroglandular synapse is transmitting an impulse from a neuron to glands. So we have gland cells receiving impulse from a neuron. So that is another classification of synapse that we can look at. Then, aside that to um, the neuron to neuron um, synapse, we can also have some subclassifications based on where the neuron one is and uh, the neuron two is receiving the impulse from. What am I trying to say? All I'm saying is that looking at the first, the top um, neuron, we are saying we have this axon terminal of neuron one sending information to this neuron two. But with this one, we are saying the um, information is sent to the soma or the cell body of neuron two, as you can see. So it's not the dendrites that is receiving the impulse. The impulse is directly sent to the soma or the cell body. And therefore, the synapse there is called the azosomatic synapse. The azo is coming from the axon terminal of neuron one. Somatic is coming from the soma of neuron two. So azosomatic junction or synapse is between the axon terminal of one neuron and the cell body of the second neuron. Then we have the common one that we can talk of, which is the azodendritic synapse. Azodendritic, we are saying is um, between the, the synapse is between the um, axon terminal and then of neuron one and then the dendrite of two. So the axon terminal of neuron one and then the dendrite of neuron two. So that gives the name azodendritic synapse. And mind you, all these synapses are helping the the nest or yes, the nest to transmit impulses from one neuron to the other. Then we have the azoazonal synapse. The azoazonal is also um, between the axon terminal of neuron one and then the axon of neuron two. The axon terminal of neuron one and the axon of neuron two. That's why it's azoazonal synapse. So these are another, these are the type, the subclassifications of the neuron to neuron synapse. Then the chemical and electrical synapse I mentioned of we are saying um, the chemical one is involved with the release of neurotransmitters, just as we said. So these neurotransmitters are chemicals, okay, that binds to their specific receptor, and then they, tra they continue transmission of impulse. And then we have the electrical that is involved in the um, ionic concentration differences occurring, and then these same ions crossing the gap junction between the two neurons 
into the cell. Okay, so one is involved with chemicals, which is the chemical synapse, and then one is involved with electrical, which involves the change in ionic concentration across the synapse. So the common one in the, in the body that we can always um, use as, as example is the chemical sinus, the chemical sinus. And um, let's take this as a reading assignment. So we, when we meet on Sunday, God willing, we discuss. So please um, research on the synapse, examples of synapse um, and the chemical and then also under electrical in the body. I hope, class, you can hear me. Yes, madam. Let's take the question yes. again. Yes, so just give me examples of synapse in the body under chemical and then under electrical. The electrical. Okay. So, this is an example of a chemical synapse. Now, before we move to transmission of impulse, we want to look at how an impulse crosses the synapse. Then we continue from there. So this arrow is showing two minutes. This arrow is showing that Information or impulses moved along the axon, okay? And this is the axon terminal. This part is the axon terminal. Let's take note. Now, at the axon terminal, we have vesicles that contains neurotransmitters. Now, we are saying that before an impulse will cross this axon terminal, and move to the synapse and then reach out to the second neuron, there need to be the release of calcium ions. All that we are trying to say is that the impulse that is coming from the axon, when it reaches the axon terminal, it triggers um, calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels to open. When it opens, it causes calcium ions to move from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. Intracellular because it's the inside of the cell. Extracellular because it surrounds the cell, external of the cell. So we are saying that when an impulse or information reaches the axon terminal, we are saying it triggers voltage-gated calcium channels to open. And mind you, these channels are what? They are proteins that is found in the cell membrane. And mind you also, when we are doing introductory, I mentioned that channels transport ions. Okay, channels transport ions. And we mentioned gated channels and open channels. I hope you remember. So all that we are doing, we are building up on what you've done. So you mentioned gated channels and then um, open channels. So this kind of channel that is at the axon terminal involved in this uh, mechanism is um, gated channel, gated. So when, it's when the impulse gets here that this gated channel will open and it opens because of the difference in ionic concentration. That's why it's voltage, voltage gated channel. So when the impulse gets here, this voltage gated calcium channel opens. When it opens, it causes the influx of um, calcium into the, the cell. When I say influx of calcium, I'm just saying movement of calcium will move from the external into the cell. And just to remind you again, we stated that calcium is in their higher concentration outside. So in the extracellular fluid, you have more calcium than the inside. Okay. So calcium will move from their higher concentration outside to their lower concentration inside. Let me ask this question again. What type of transport mechanism does calcium use to move from the extracellular 
into the intracellular. What type of transport moves calcium from the extracellular into the intracellular? Irene. Active transport. Why active transport? Because we said in active transport, uh, uh, molecules are transport. Uh, Anna, please let me come, let me prepare and come again. Okay, okay, all right. Um, let me see. Daniel. Yes, madam. Yes. I think it's um it's passive transport because um the calcium moves from outside that is uh why it is highly concentrated and moving in into the into the cell where there is low concentrations of calcium. Okay, that is right. But can you be specific with the type, the exact type of transport? That is endocytosis. No, endocytosis is not under yes. passive transport. Endocytosis, exocytosis are all vesicular transport. And vesicular transport uses energy, so it's under active transport. Daniel. Well, madam, it's diffusion. No, wait. Did you understand what I just said? Yes, madam. So I'm saying that the exocytosis, endocytosis, all the transport that is involved in vesicles, okay, formation of vesicles is under active transport. It uses energy, okay? Yes, okay, okay. okay. Yes, but here the question is, we are transporting ions, think... calcium ions, from where they are high outside to where they are low. What kind of transport is this? Daniel. Um, this is by osmosis. Daniel, um, what but, is osmosis? Um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Of the 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 reason. But how do you understand osmosis? <laughs> osmosis. Yes. Uh, I think osmosis is a movement of. Okay, well, that that, that one is uh, with liquid. No there. <laughs> uh, Daniel, were you in class last last time? I think the last two meetings. The last two, last last uh, two Sundays, yes. Madam, I was there, but uh, my my area, I think the, the, the network is always a challenge. So I I part of the, part of the, the, the lecture. I think it, uh, full of it, full part of it. Okay. Okay, I'll try and then get the the audio to you. I don't have access, so I'll, I'll the eyes. Okay, thank you, madam. Yes, so, but please try and then just go through the slides again carefully. Okay, on front. Okay, okay, okay madam. All right. Yes, um, Diana, Diana, answer. What type of transport? Um, Daniel, sorry, uh, Dinah, Dinah, answer. What type of transport does cal calcium use to move from the external or extracellular to the intracellular of the cell? Then it is facilitated diffusion. Why facilitate it? It is a, a, an electric ion. And ions travel through channels, and channels travel through facilitated diffusions. Yes, yes, you are right. So it's facilitated diffusion. Mind you, I said ions carry charge. And because they carry charge, they are polar. Because they are polar, they can't pass through the cell membrane directly. Okay, so therefore they will need help. That's why they need to be facilitated. They need to be aided by a carrier protein. And the name of the carrier protein that transports ions are what? 
channels. So whenever you hear channel, channel transporting ions is just under facilitated diffusion. And that is when we are moving the ions from their higher concentration to their lower concentration. Okay, so please take note of the transport. Please go over transport mechanisms carefully and um, try and then understand. Okay, you are, I'll try and then see if I can get the audios to you tomorrow. Brother. Please prepare towards that um, for your meeting. It's, it looks as if a lot of you are confused about the transport. Please revisit your slides and then. Um, Okay, so calcium will move from their higher concentration to their lower concentration through facilitated diffusion. So this is just an example of a carrier protein called channel, as you can see, channel. So calcium will move from the outside to the inside. Now when it gets to the inside, it will trigger this vertical to move to the, the surface of the cell membrane. Okay, so uh, in the presence of this calcium, vesicles, synaptic vesicles will move from the interior of the axon terminal to the surface of the cell membrane. Now, when that happens, we have um, a protein that is docking protein that, that is found in the cell membrane. Whenever this vesicular uh, vesicles attach themselves to this protein, it triggers them to be able to fuse with the cell membrane. When that happens, the neurotransmitters inside the vesicles will be released into the synapse. All that you are trying to do here is to release these neurotransmitters chemicals into the synapse so that to continue the transmission of impulse. And first of all, I said we have the impulse arriving at the azon terminal. The impulse arriving at the azon terminal. When it gets here, we have it triggers the voltage gated calcium channels open. When the calcium channels open, calcium will move into the cell. When calcium gets into the cell, it will also trigger these particles to move to the surface of the cell membrane. When it gets to the surface of the cell membrane, it binds to this protein, and then it causes this vesicle to fuse with the cell membrane, releasing the neurotransmitters to the sinus. Can someone um, explain to me how the impulse causes the release of neurotransmitters into the sinus, just as how I just did it? From your understanding, class, can you hear me? Someone is saying my yes, voice please. is speaking. Is the question again? Is it from my end or? Can I hear you? Okay, all right. So the question again, just as I've explained, okay, with the diagram you see on the slide, how are these neurotransmitters? released into the synapse. How are these neurotransmitters released into the synapse? Irene. Madam, I want to try. Yes, try. Okay, so you said uh, when the impulse is being released, so they move uh, along the cell Irene. membrane. Irene, Madam. yes, so as you are saying it, I'll be correcting you, okay? So okay. the impulse is not released. You see, the impulse, just let's look at this. So the impulse is traveling from the axon of neuron one, as you can see here. Okay, okay. so what you see here is the axon, myelinated. You can okay. see the myelin sheet around it. And you already yes. did this with that tree, okay? So yes. the axon is this one, and you have the impulse being transmitted through the axon. So it gets to the axon okay. terminal. Okay. 
So it okay. has got to the Azon terminal. How does it cross the synapse? That is the question. Okay. So come again, Irene. Okay. So you said when they, they get to the Azon terminal, yeah. they pass, they go along the cell membrane. Yeah. So when they get to uh, uh, where the calcium channel, the my what is moving is the calcium uh, that is moving along the membrane. So when they get to the, the, impulse, the calcium channel, it's... The impulse is what is moving. The okay. impulse, when the impulse gets the calcium channel uh, gates, yeah. it, it causes it to open. Okay. So because the, the calcium is at a higher uh, outside than the, that is the extracellular uh, space than the inside, when it enters, it triggers the uh, vesicle. When the calcium entered into the, the gate open and the calcium entered into the intracellular space of the cell, yeah. it goes to trigger the vesicle. And the okay. vesicle moves uh, uh, down to fuse with uh, uh, the docking protein thereby releasing okay. the neurotransmitters. Yes, yes, I'll take that. When it, it, it binds with this docking protein, it fuses with the cell membrane. It gives its ability to fuse with the cell membrane. So when the fusion happens, it causes the neurotransmitters to be released to the outside. Well done, Irene. Well done. Thank Any you, other? Mother. You are welcome. Any other? Any other? Yes, Daniel. Um, Madam, let me, let me try. Okay. Um, uh, from the explanation that you give, um, you said when impulses are moving along the, the axon and they get to uh, the calcium gated channels, they okay. cause the calcium gated channels uh, to open. Where okay. the calcium, there is influx of calcium from the extracellular fluid into the uh, intracellular fluid. And okay. when calcium enters into the uh, intracellular fluid compartment, it it causes uh, it moves to cause the synoptic uh, vesicles to move closer to the membrane. And when they move closer to the membranes, they get attached to the protein. Okay. And when they move, when they they get attached to the protein, protein, this gives uh, the vesicles the the ability to to attach to the cell membrane. Yeah. And when they attach to the cell membrane, they are now they are then released into the, the synopsis by exocytosis. Great, great. The, that's, uh, wow, that's great. Let's take the two submissions. So if you are if you're able to say it this way, that's it. You don't need any recap. Okay, it sticks directly. You don't need to go and read, 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 read. That's it. Okay. I saw some two hands. You can still come on board and share your, your submission. I hear Ble. Hello. Yeah, sister, I, I also want to, yeah. I also want yeah. to give you that to me as my yeah. sister and brother just say. So yeah. uh, as the uh, the impulses move in, uh, downwards to the terminals, it's uh, 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 the channel to open. That's the uh, voting gated channels to open in order to allow the uh, the calcium to enter into the the membrane. Then after that, it's uh, help the uh, it it help the vesicles the vesicles yeah. to move down to closer to the membrane. With the help of the docking protein, they will be attached to the membrane, and so doing, uh, open up into the uh, the receptors or the space over there for the impulses to move along. Okay, that's great. That's great. One last person. Last person. Anyone? Yes, Rose.
Okay. So, yeah. so yes, madam. So you said the impulses move around a eh, along the axon, and then okay. they enter the cell through the calcium gated channels. Where the impulse has entered the cell. The impulse moves yes. along along the cell membrane, and it triggers voltage gated calcium channels to open. Then calcium will move into the cell. Okay. okay. Yes, madam. So the impulses move along the ozone and then triggers the voltage uh, gated calcium channels to open, where calcium move from a higher concentration from outside the cell into the cell, which is termed as facilit facilitated diffusion. So when the calcium enter enters the cell, it attaches itself to the synaptic vesicles. Okay. Where it triggers the cells to attach themselves to the... It triggers the vesicles. It triggers the vesicles to attach themselves to the cell membrane. Yes. And then when it attaches itself to the cell membrane, it opens up for the um, neurotransmitters to, to be released. To attach to, to be reached and attach themselves to the receptors. Yes, yes, that is that is it. Well done. Well done. So let's continue. So basically, that's how um impulses will cross from one neuron to the other. So when you are doing the um introductory part of the nervous system. I showed you how the nerves are connected, okay? So this way. So this is, this. these are nerves. And now you should know that nerves are um, a bundle of neurons. So you have a lot of neurons coming together to form a nerve. So how are these, these neurons are connected till they, they reach the spinal cord, as you see here? I hope you are following. So we are saying that these neurons communicate, transmit the impulse from, let's say, the tip of your finger till it gets to the spinal cord for a reflex. Okay. So we are talking of how these neurons would communicate from one to two to three to four till it gets the impulse gets to where it's supposed to get to. That's what we are doing. And all that we are learning is at the basic level, at the cellular level, between the cells, between the cells. So now we've learned how the impulse will cross one neuron to the other, one neuron to the other. All right. So, then we, we will look at how um, the impulse is um, going to be received from the dendrites and how it's going to be transmitted from the dendrites to the cell body, to the axon, okay? Because we've already done how it will tra be transmitted from the axon terminal to another neuron. Now we want to look at how this impulse will be received at the dendrite and then be passed to the soma and then to the axon. Now we are saying that action potential at the presynaptic neuron opens voltage gated calcium channel, channels concentrated in the terminal. Calcium will flow in, calcium causes the vesicles to fuse with the membrane, releasing neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters will diffuse across the synaptic layer. So this is just the, what you've said so far, okay. Okay, um, Stephen, is there, is there a question? Yeah, doctor, there is a question. All right. I want to know how this uh, refer pin okay to, through this explanation. Come again, how does? Does the refer pin? Refer pin? Yes, doctor. Okay, okay. So, um, all that you are doing as I said is at the basic level at the basic level, meaning we are taking just one cell, looking at what is actually occurring. Okay. So
So the pain and all other um, emotions and all other uh, feelings and all that, they are they are all at the let me say at the tissue level, at the tissue level, at the nerve level. But our main emphasis is what is occurring at the basic level. Okay, and pain would be as a result of a particular or a specific type of neurotransmitter release that will send the impulse across. So um, what the information is or how the information is, is dependent on the particular neurotransmitter release. Okay, so as we move on, we tend to look at some types of neurotransmitters and at what point are they released to transmit an impulse. Okay, I hope that is clear. Yes, doctor. Yeah. So, um, Daniel, a question? Yes, please, madam. Please, uh, I want to know whether, like, calcium is the only uh, ion that can, that, 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 that can help in the transmission, or there are other ions in the body that can also um, be put in place of uh, calcium. No, Thank you. It's only calcium that helps with the a transmission of impulse from the axon terminal to the postsynaptic neuron. It's only calcium ions. However, we have different ions across. I told you earlier during introductory, we have different ions both inside and outside with different concentrations. Okay, but it's only the calcium that is, that will be released that will trigger um, the vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane. It's only calcium ions. Yeah, thank you very much, madam. You're welcome. Williams. Uh, um, no, uh, please, I was adding up to the question my brother asked. All right. Uh, so um, from our basic knowledge in electrolyte, we know that every electrolyte has its um, work that it does. So the work of calcium is, for, is to help with electrical transmissions or impulses. Just like yeah. we have potassium, which helps with, um, which works with the muscles. Okay. Then we have sodium, which works with retaining and uh, let's say water balance in the body. So every electrolyte in the body has its function. So basically that's what I want to add to it. Yes, so every ion has its own function in the body. Calcium, you are saying it helps with the transport of uh, impulse from one neuron to the other at the basic level, at the basic level. However, um, we, together with the potassium, as you said, calcium is also involved in muscles, okay, with contraction of muscles, calcium. So calcium, just like how calcium is released to allow for uh, continuation of impulse or something like that, you also have um, calcium released inside the muscles, muscle cell. That would enable contraction. When we get there, we'll talk more about it. So each ion or electrolyte has a specific function in their body. Okay. So now we are continuing the process. So we are saying the neurotransmitter will bind to its receptor in the postsynaptic cell. So let me move back. So we are saying now we have the neurotransmitters here in the synapse. Okay, and we are saying the first, uh, the continuation, we are saying the neurotransmitter will bind to a specific receptor in the postsynaptic cell or postsynaptic neuron. So as you can see, we have a specific receptor that only this neurotransmitter can bind to. We have different receptors that have, that binds to different neurotransmitters. Okay, so for this neurotransmitter, just look at the shape it binds to its specific receptor on the postsynaptic membrane. Then the transmitter re receptor complex causes a transient change in the conductance of postsynaptic memory to one or more ions, causing a transient change in the memory potential. So all that you are saying is that this complex form is the transmitter receptor complex because we have the neurotransmitter binding to the receptor. It forms a complex. Now this complex will also cause a trigger of the opening of sodium channels, voltage-gated sodium channels. When it opens, we have the influx of sodium inside the cell, changing 
the concentration, the ionic concentration around the cell membrane here. And that will also trigger the change along the cell membrane. And that, will, that is basically how the information will be transmitted. As you move on, you get to know that transmission of impulse along the cell membrane is basically differences in ionic concentration. It's just differences in ionic concentration. So you are saying this complex that will be formed will cause a change, okay, that will cause sodium, voltage gated sodium channels and other channels to open, causing change in ionic concentration. Whenever there's change in ionic concentration, that is that means the impulse has been moved from one point of the cell membrane to the other. Then we are saying a transient depolarization causes an excitatory postsynaptic potential. A transient hyperpolarization causes an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So we are saying that the type of neurotransmitter that binds to its receptor can be either excitatory or inhibitory. Excitatory meaning it would cause um, sodium channels to be to be released into the cell, and therefore it will cause um, depolarization, depolarization. And then inhibitory meaning it will also cause potassium channels to open, causing the inside of the um, the inside of the cell to be less negative, and then that will be inhibitory, inhibitory. So that's another um, state of the information or impulse move. Okay, so depending on the neurotransmitter that will be released, it can be either excitatory or inhibitory. Hello. Okay, so, yes, so please, a minute. So all these, yeah, I'm going to talk in details about them in action potential. Action potential is the main topic of how information or impulses move across the cell memory. Information is moved across the cell membrane, action potential. So in action potential, we look at depolarization, hyperpolarization. Okay, so we are saying action potentials are not produced at the sinus. They are not produced at the sinus. However, action potential is produced at the axon instead, at the axon instead. Okay, so at this point, let me have questions. If there's any questions before we move into the action potential or how the impulse moves across the axon itself. Hello, please, Doug. Yes. Yeah, please, uh, I have a question. I think my hand was earlier on, but uh, All right. I think All right. Uh, just to take us back some more. Uh, it has to do with the calcium. I, I okay. just want to know the, the physiology behind uh, this uh, chivostic and then trozoal signs in, in hypocalcemia. Since uh, we are talking about calcium, where we said the calcium gated channel, I mean, help with the release of these uh, ions. So, if you can help me with the physiology behind the, the chivostic and the, the trosul sign, as in hypocalcemia. Okay, okay. Um, can we can we move ahead a little? Probably we can. I can answer your question as you move on. Okay, 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 thank you. Ahead a little. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So um calcium, calcium is very important. Okay, calcium is very important. Uh, even at the tissue level, we know what calcium does. But at the cellular level, as I said, this is what it does. And then it's also needed more in um muscles, muscle cells, specifically. Skeletal muscle cells. Okay. So before skeletal muscle cell contract, or before you're even able to move any part of your body, you have calcium performing a, a, a significant role in that. So I'll talk more about that when we get there. Okay. All right. The who please who, who asked the question? This is Samuel. Samuel. Okay, Samuel. All right. Um, okay, Abraqua, your hand is up. I'm the one. I'm the one. So I've lowered it. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. Some more. Thank you. All right. So, Daniel. 
Madam, please. Um, the part that you just you just ended, you know, that I, 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 I've, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm confused more. So if you can take that again, please. Please, which one? Which which one am I picking again, Daniel? The uh, the receiving of impulse that that is uh, the transmitted impulse from uh, the the pre synaptic uh, nerve or neuron to the other the, the the nearby one. Okay, so with the impulse moving from this to this. From yes. the neuron one to neuron two? Yes, please, madam. Okay, so we are saying that when the neurons, the neurotransmitters gets to the synapse, okay, it binds to a specific receptor, then that continues the movement of information or impulse. I'm, I'm going to spend more time on the transport or the transport of impulse across the cell memory here and the dendrites, okay. And then the transport of information or impulse along the axon. I'm going to spend more time on that. It's a whole topic on its own. So now that we are done with how the impulse will move from one neuron to the other, let's look at how the impulse moves along the axon itself or along the dendrites itself. So with this, we are we already stated neurotransmitters and what they do. They are chemical substances which are released at the end of a neuron by the arrival of an impulse, okay? And by diffusing across the synapse or junction effects the transfer of an impulse to another neuron, a muscle cell or some other structure, okay? So all that you are saying is these neurotransmitters are chemicals, okay? And they are released at the end of a neuron. That is the axon terminal. And upon the arrival, they effect the transfer of an impulse. Okay, they cause the transfer of an impulse to another neuron or a muscle fiber or gland or any other structure. We have types. We have neuroexcitus, neuroinhibitors. So neuroexcitus from the name excites. And when you say excite, they cause depolarization. And I'll talk more about this in action potential. So just know that neuroexcitus would excite, okay, causing excitatory. Neuroinhibitors will inhibit. When we inhibit, we are causing inhibitory, okay. So we have these two um, um, situations happening. We have the excitatory postsynaptic potentials, and we have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So excitatory postsynaptic potentials happens in the presence of neuroexcitus. So you shouldn't chew this thing. This, we have neuroexcitus causing excitatory postsynaptic potential. And we have neuroinhibitors causing inhibitory postsynaptic potential, as simple as that. Now we are moving ahead to better explain what excitatory is, better to explain what inhibitory is. We are saying examples of these neuroexcitus are norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, aspartate, glutamate. All these are neurotransmitters that are released at the synapse based on the particular impulse that is being transmitted. We are saying neuroexcitus cause depolarization of the postsynaptic memory, resulting in excitatory postsynaptic potentials. So aside that, you can have a lot of them, other excitus. And then we have neuroinhibitors. These inhibitors, they cause hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic memory, resulting in inhibitory postsynaptic potential. I hope you are not confused. When I say postsynaptic memory, you should know that that is the neuron 2. Postsynaptic memory, that is the neuron 2. Okay, presynaptic memory is what? Neuron 1. Okay, all right. And examples of these neuroinhibitors, we have GABA, glycine, acetylcholine, and so on. Okay, we have a lot of them. So depending on the type of neurotransmitter released at the junction or synapse, you can either have the excitatory or inhibitory occurring.
ओके नाउ लेट्स लुक एट मेमोरीन पोटेंशियल मेमोरीन पोटेंशियल मेमोरीन पोटेंशियल इज गोइंग टू लीड अस टू एक्शन पोटेंशियल ग्रेडेड पोटेंशियल एंड सो ऑन सो एम व्हेन वी आर डूइंग द इंट्रोडक्टरी फिजियोलॉजी वी आर लुकिंग एट द सेल and when we are looking at the cell we look at the different composition or components of ions we have both at the extracellular and then the intracellular and with the extracellular i mainly mentioned sodium ions as the um the ion that is highly concentrated in the extracellular and the intracellular i made mention of potassium ions if that if you remember Okay, we are building upon that. So all that we are going to talk about in transmission of impulse is ionic differences. Ionic differences. I hope you are following. I need your maximum attention at this stage. Your maximum attention. So we are going to talk about ions where they are found high, where they are found low, and at a point during the cell transmission. Um. where which concentration is much where and and there you get it so we are basically going to look at ionic differences across the cell so from the name resting membrane potential resting membrane potential resting when something is resting okay in physiology or basically in science when you are saying we are at rest meaning we are not performing the function that you have to okay Then you say resting membrane potential of a neuron. You know the function of a neuron as to transmit impulse. So when the neuron is not transmitting any information or impulse, we are saying the neuron is at its resting membrane potential. Let me take that again. We are saying that when a cell is not performing its function as it should, okay. is at its resting membrane potential a neuron transmits impulse a neuron transmits impulse and therefore we are saying that when the neuron is not transmitting any impulse or information is at rest when it says is at rest meaning it's not performing its function as i've just said so a basic definition of resting membrane potential we are saying the voltage or charge difference across the cell membrane when the cell is at rest when it's not performing its function the voltage or charge difference across the cell membrane that is it and we are saying resting membrane potential exists in all cells in every cell so when a cell is not performing its function it has a particular voltage difference across the cell membrane and voltage difference is just the ionic differences across the cell sodium is high outside than the inside that creates an ionic difference or voltage difference potassium is high inside than the outside that creates a voltage difference chloride also is high is it outside or inside chloride is high in the inside than the outside which creates a voltage difference calcium is high in the outside than the inside which creates a voltage difference so and we have magnesium phosphate different kinds of ions and their concentrations in and out so these differences comes together to create an ionic difference or a voltage difference across the cell membrane that gives the cell its resting membrane potential we are saying in neurons the resting membrane potential is 70 millivolts negative 70 millivolts what we are trying to say here is that the inside of the neuron is 70 times negative than the outside the inside of the neuron cell or the neuron is 70 times negative than the outside please is that clear before we move on we are building upon this so you need to understand this yes any please. questions all right da yeah daniel Yes, uh, madam. Please, yes. uh, I want to know uh, this this uh, charge difference. Is it a, yes. is it a summation of all the ions, 
all the ions inside the the, uh, uh, the cell all is one particular uh, ion. Okay, so it's not directly the sum, but yes, I will say it's it is a cumulative charges. Okay, it cumulates the charges in and out. Okay, and you remember we did sodium potassium ATPs and the active transport. How does that function? Let's do a recap on that. Daniel, I'll answer your question. Yeah. In fact, I've answered it. I just want to explain further. So yeah. let's answer this question then I explain further. How does okay. the sodium potassium ATPs work? Daniel? Daniel, yes, do you remember I... sodium potassium ATPs? No, please, no, please madam. Okay. Um, can someone help with sodium potassium ATPs? It's under transport mechanism. It's under active transport. It's under primary active transport. Can someone help with a recap of sodium potassium ATPs? Hey, it's in your it's in your exam, so this transport transport, please you have to sit and then work on it. Okay. Anyone from the class? Sodium potassium ATPs. Wow, no one. Irene, at least I, I should get a submission before I move on. We, we did this the other time. And someone sent this up, right? Salome. Um, doctor, please, are you referring to it being an antipot? Um, yes, it's an antipot, but how does it work? How does it work? Um, it works as in if uh, sodiums are moving inside it, then the potassiums are going now through the, uh, uh, the channels. Um, through, yes, through the pump, okay. Yes. Yeah, it's a pump. That's how you say it. it's a pump. Okay. okay, you said something. Well done. Um, Let me see. Martin, Martin. It helps to uh, balance this potassium and, and then sodium ion in and out of the cell. How? Well done, well said, that is it, how? Hello, can Martin. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, Martin, how does that happen? All right, um, William? Williams, can you help us? Uh, yes, Madam. Yeah. Um, hello, Madam. Please, can you hear me? Yes, please. I can hear you. Hello? Yeah, hello. Yeah. So, yeah. with uh, sodium and uh, potassium, the sodium is um, pumped out of the out of the cell uh, into the interstitial fluid by the sodium potassium pump and this creates a concentration uh, concentration gradient so with um higher concentration of sodium outside the cell then the movement does okay so with the william continue yes so with the ATPs working as 
So the ATPs is there to um help to um help the uh ionic concentration to function. So without that, then that's when we have the loss in uh, integrity of the membrane. So that is why we have the ATPs there. So what happens is the the pumps they expand energy to move the substances uh, against their electrochemical gradient. So when that happens, then we have the sodium moving in and the potassium going out. That's uh, exchange. That is what I can say about it. Okay. So how many sodium moves out? How many potassium comes in? Williams. Yes, ma'am. How many sodium moves out? How many potassium comes in? Uh, for that one, I need help. All right. Uh, Mogdor. Yeah, Mogdor. Yeah, uh, this there is a uh, sodium move out, then two potassium move in. Yeah, yeah, that is it. So, well done. Well said, Williams and then Mogdor and Salome. Okay. So with sodium, just to do a recap, we said sodium potassium ATP works in the presence of ATP to transport three sodium molecules from their lower concentration inside the cell to the outside where they are mean. And that's why it's an active. They are moving from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Whilst that is happening, we have potassium, two molecules of potassium also moving from where they are low outside into where there are many inside. That's why it's also under active transport. Now we have three three molecules of sodium, okay, moving out. So three plus is moving out. Then you have two plus or two potassium molecules coming in. There'll be a deficit of what? One inside, right? <laughs> right. Madam, are you paying attention? Yes, 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 madam. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yeah. So if three plus is moving out and two plus is moving in, there will be minus one inside. Okay. And then yes. that's how this sodium potassium ATP works, and that is normal for the cell. Okay. And then we also have um some proteins found inside the cell that carry a negative charge. Okay, that also contributes to the how negative the inside of, of the cell is. Aside that, we have different proteins and other molecules that carry a negative charge that are anions, okay? And they, they are found inside the cell, okay? And that creates that negative environment inside the cell. So with the neurons, we have negative 70 because the inside of the cell is 70 times negative than the outside. Okay, so that cumulative negative um, charges makes the inside of the cell negative than the outside. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't mean that the outside there is no negative charge. There, there is, but we are saying the inside is 70 times negative than the outside. I hope that is clear. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yes, right. please. Yeah. Okay. So other cells would have different resting membrane potentials. So as at when we get to the different systems, we talk about it. For the nervous system, for the neurons, we are saying the inside of the neurons is 70 times negative than the outside. Yes, Williams. Um, sorry, madam. I want to answer the last question. I didn't put my hand up. All right, Daniel. Yes, uh, madam. Please, uh, with the with the sodium sodium potassium ATPs that uh that has just been explained, I want to ask, you know, uh, for the explanation, we 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 got we realize that uh there will be a deficit of one. That is a deficit of minus one because three yeah. molecules are moving out and then uh two. I mean. 
yeah, three are moving out and then two molecules are moving in. So like if this one continues, uh, the charge difference will it be accumulated and will that, will that have any effect on the cell? Um, no, it will be accumulated, yes. There, there will be deficits, minus, minus, a lot of minus inside. That is creating that negative 70 of the, the inside, okay? And that is the normal state of the cell. Okay, physiologically, that is how the cell has been created. That is how it is, okay? So the moment where the, uh, the negative 70 moves to, let's say, negative 60, negative 50, negative 40, that means the cell is at work. So when the cell is not at work, it's always at negative 70. That's the resting membrane potential. So it's normal for the cell. It is not going to create any abnormality anywhere. That is the normal state of the inside of the cell. The inside of the cell carries a negative charge, always. Okay, thank yes. you very much, madam. You're welcome. Mogdo. Please, madam. Uh, could there be instances whereby we can find the resting membrane potential uh, having more than negative 70? So like, so like negative 90. Like negative 90 or like negative 95? Yes, that means the cell is not at rest anymore. Take note. So whenever the, the, the resting membrane potential shifts from negative 70, whether up or down, meaning the cell is not at rest anymore. We are still talking of resting membrane potential. Okay, so as you move on, you get to know the times where the resting the membrane potential can move to negative 90, negative 100, and the times it can move to negative 50, negative 60, negative 10. You get it. The point where it can get to yeah, negative 10. All right. So we are saying that at this point, we are only looking at the normal state of the cell when it's at rest. All right. So we are saying a resting cell is said to be polarized. Polarized. And by now you should know the meaning of polarization or polarized or polar. All right. So we are saying the resting membrane potential. So you have the extracellular. This is just a, a representation. Okay. So the extracellular, you can see the plus, plus, plus. The inside is minus, minus, minus. That doesn't mean the outside there's no minus, the inside there's no plus, there is. But just to represent that the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside, we are using this picture or scenario. Okay, I think um, let's discuss this question. All views on board. We are saying increasing the external potassium concentration increases the resting membrane potential. Now we've, 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 we we now know the meaning of resting membrane potential. And from the introductory parts that we did, we are saying increasing the external potassium ion concentration increases the resting membrane potential. Think about it. Increasing the external potassium concentration increases the resting membrane potential. Why? Decreasing the external sodium concentration has little effect on the resting membrane potential. Why? We can screenshot this and we'll make a discussion on it when we are getting to the end of the class. We can screenshot and then we, we discuss it. I believe that is done. All right. Now, so just to look at a, pic a picture illustrating the resting membrane potential, you know the outside is more of sodium, as you can see. You can have 150 millimoles of sodium. And then we have 15 here. So it's low here, it's high out. Chloride is high out, low in. We have potassium high in, low out, and so on. So different ions are also there. And we are saying, we have the presence of the sodium potassium ATPs moving three molecules of sodium out against their concentration and moving two molecules of potassium in against their concentration. So that's minus one together with anions inside the cell, 
plus proteins that carry a negative charge would contribute to the negative environment inside the cell. Now, two types of responses can be elicited if a neuron is stimulated. The type of neurons depend, the type of response depends on the intensity of stimulation. Okay, so the type of response generated, I still want to use this picture to continue what you are trying to do. So now we have neurotransmitters released in the synapse, binds to the receptor. Now we are saying the response generated is in two forms. We have a graded potential and an action potential. So we are still continuing the transmission of inputs. So the response generated here can be graded potential or um, action potential. Let's move and explain what this means. So graded potentials. Graded potentials mainly are, um, um, they are started, okay, at the dendrites or the cell body. Okay, that's the basic difference that I can give you. Graded potentials occur at the dendrites and then the cell bodies of the neuron. Whilst action potential occurs at the axon or at the axon. That's the basic difference I can give for the two. Now let's move to the, the details of each of them. We are saying any stimulus that opens a gated channel produces a graded potential. Now we have um, there is the neurotransmitter binding to the receptor. Now when it binds to the receptor, it triggers the opening of voltage gated channels. Okay, I'll take it again. When the receptor, sorry, when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, it triggers the voltage gated channels to open. Now, we want to look at the specific voltage gated channels that will be open. For the transmission of information or impulse, basically we open sodium channels, voltage gated sodium channels. Let's take note. Voltage gated sodium channels. So we are saying that this voltage gated channel should open in the presence of the transmitter receptor complex. Okay, so we are saying graded potentials are changes in the membrane potential that cannot spread far from the site of stimulation elicited by a stimulus of sub threshold strength. I know I'm speaking a lot of English or physiology. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking it down. I'm breaking it down. Now let's take it one after the other. We've already established that these graded potentials happen at the dendrites and then the cell body of the neuron. And therefore we are saying that they cannot spread far from the site of simulation. Okay. Unlike action potential that spreads across an entire axon, okay, with graded potential, when it starts at the dendrite, it can just spread through the dendrite and then the cell body. That is it. Okay, unless it hits a threshold, unless it hits a threshold, if it doesn't hit a threshold, it doesn't move on. That impulse will die out within the dendrite or the cell body. That is it. And that is known as the graded potential. So we are saying that graded potentials would not spread from the site of stimulation. So just at the dendrites and the cell body, they, they, they transmit the impulse just around that, that portion. They don't move across to the axon. And therefore, they are not even, even able to reach a sub-threshold where it can generate an action potential. What are we saying about threshold? We are saying threshold is the point where um, the voltage gated sodium channels will open within the axon. Mind you, transmission of impulse, whenever the, the axon is not involved, it cannot pass on, it, can, it cannot move on, okay? So we are saying that 
whenever uh, impulse is received at the dendrites and then it passes through the cell body and it is not able to reach negative 55, which is um, the threshold, that information on impulse dies out. That means that information will not pass through the axon to another neuron. I hope that is clear. Okay. Any question on graded potential before we move on? Any question on graded potential? Now we are saying resting membrane potential is the normal state of the cell when the cell is negative inside the it's negative it's 70 times negative than the outside. Okay, and that is normal for the cell. And we are saying with graded potential, whenever there's an open of a gated channel, okay, this graded potential occurs. And when it occurs, it doesn't spread out to a very far um, location. It just spread out just at where it was stimulated, stimulated the dendrites and the cell bodies. Okay. And it is not able to cross the axon hillock to the axon. And therefore, it dies out within the dendrites and the cell body. That is graded potential. And we are saying that since it's not able to breach the threshold, it doesn't move to the axon and therefore it dies out in the dendrite and then the cell body. That is rooted potential. Any questions? Yes, Daniel. Yes, um, thank you, madam. Please, I want to know the uh, the, thres the threshold of uh, the negative, negative five five. Yeah. That's negative 55. I don't know whether, is it, is it from inside or is uh, outside the cell? Oh, we are talking about the figures you'll be seeing. We are looking at the inside. So the negative 70 millivolts for resting membrane potential is the inside. The inside is 70, ne ne 70 times negative. So the inside is negative 70. Okay. Okay, so, thank you, man. And when I was talking of resting membrane potential, I said, whenever there's a slight change in that the, that figure, whether negative 60, negative 69, negative 66, that means the cell is at work. So we have this threshold, okay, negative 55 millivolts, that the impulse should reach before it can move to the axon. If it doesn't reach negative 55, it can't be transmitted. I hope that is clear. That is the meaning of threshold. Yeah. Threshold is yeah, Reaching its peak where it can generate an action potential, where where it can move ahead to be transmitted. If it doesn't reach this negative fifty five, it can move on. Thank you, madam. All right. Yes, Eric. Yes, madam. So please, madam, if I get you well, uh, in that case, um, the graded potential doesn't reach the negative 55 so in that case it's um the nerve impulse transmission ends at the high loop or the high loom of the uh, the the neuron is that the case it ends at the cell body you see that the, the cell body to the axon hello just there it ends there okay and and so that is it it ends there but whenever it's able to hit the threshold which is negative 55 it turns into an action potential along the axon. So whenever an, an impulse is transmitted along the axon or it reaches the axon hillock and hits the threshold, it turns into an action potential. I hope that yeah. is clear. Thank you very much. Daniel. Madam, please, uh, this, I, I, want to, I want to know about uh, uh, the figures that, that, that we are seeing. Is it from is it with the reference to our normal counting, like uh, where we know that negative forty is greater than uh, negative fifty-five? Or yes, yes, yes. So yes, so we are saying increasing the external potassium concentration increases the resting membrane potential. Then we are saying when you are increasing the resting membrane potential, meaning it's moving towards negative eighty. Negative 90, negative 100. Do you get it? Daniel. Madam. Increasing the resting membrane potential. Let's say you are increasing negative 70. When you are increasing negative 70, it's moving to negative 80, negative 90. 
It's yes, just please. from the basic mathematics. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Any question? Please, can you hear me? Some are saying they can't hear me. We can hear you. All right. So, all right. So, so, as I said, graded potentials normally happen at the dendrites and the cell bodies of the neurons. Okay. The cell bodies and the dendrites of the neuron. Whenever you hear transmission of impulse at the cell body and then dendrites, we are talking of graded potentials. Whenever you hear transmission of impulse along the axon, then you are moving to what? Action potential. So you are saying graded potentials or potential will move closer to threshold, causing slight depolarization, which is called excitation. So whenever the, the membrane potential hits the threshold, it starts excitation or depolarization. What is depolarization? You are saying you are making the cell, the inside of the cell less negative. We are making the inside of the cell less negative. So from negative 70, we came to negative 55. That is the threshold. Then you move to negative 40. You are making the cell less negative, right? That is, this is simple mathematics, negative positive um, values. Okay. So when you reach negative 55, that is the threshold that can generate an action potential. And we are saying depolarization or K, that is making the inside of the cell less negative. So when you are moving to negative 55, negative 50, negative 40, negative 30, negative 10, all, all those are less negative values, right? Compared to when you are making the cell more negative, which is what? Negative 80, negative 90, negative 100. That, all that is what? More negative um, values. And when you are making the cell less negative, okay, you are saying that is what? Depolarization. Take note, when the inside of the cell becomes less negative, we are saying that is depolarization. When the inside of the cell becomes more negative, we are saying that is hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization. So we are saying that depolarization causes excitatory postsynaptic uh, membrane, uh, membrane potential. Okay. So when the inside of the cell becomes less negative, you excite the cell. When you excite the cell, you cause more sodium to move in, more sodium to move in till it reaches the peak. Now, when you make the cell, the inside of the cell, more negative, you are saying that is hyperpolarization. Hyperpolarization will cause inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So for now, just know that when the inside of the cell is less negative, we call it depolarization, where the inside of the cell is more, is more negative, is hyperpolarization. Where the inside of the cell is less negative, is depolarization. Just note the difference. And depolarization will cause excitatory postsynaptic. And then hyperpolarization will, call, will, will, will allow for inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Just note that. So as you move on and we get to action potential, you get to know what at what stage this is occurring and what it causes. We are saying graded potential arises mainly in the dendrites and the cell bodies. And we are saying um, they either extend to form or to become hyperpolarization, that is causing inhibitory or depolarization causing excitatory. So I would like to end the class here so that you continue this on Sunday so that you don't get more confused. I'm sure some of you are already thinking of so Today, so far, we learned of the communication between neurons, how impulses process the axon terminal or crosses the synapse and then move to the next uh, neuron. 
also done resting membrane potential and we've established that the inside of the negative is more negative than the outside. And then we've also established that we have different ionic concentrations that causes the change, the difference in the um, membrane across the cell. And then we also establish the fact that the resting membrane potential is, is when the cell is at rest, it's not performing expansion. And we move to the graded potential where we are saying that whenever the cell bodies and the dendrites receive an impulse, is this graded potential that is generated. This graded potential is generated when there's an open in some gated channels, as you talked about. And therefore, we are also saying that whenever the graded potentials don't hit the threshold, okay, they don't hit the threshold, which is negative 55 millivolts, they just remain there and die out. However, if it's able to cross the threshold, which is negative 55, and become less negative, negative 40, negative 30, that is action potential. And action potential, we mentioned that it's, it's, it moves impulses across the axon, across the axon. And mind you, if an informational impulse does not get to the axon, there's no way it's going to get to the axon terminal to be tra transmitted to another neuron. And therefore, it's very important that impulses reaches the threshold for it to be crossed into an action potential along the axon to be transmitted throughout the body. We also learned depolarization, which is the inside of the cell less negative than negative 70. We also mentioned hyperpolarization, which is the inside of the cell more negative than negative 70. Any question up to this point? Any question up to this point? Someone is asking, Derek, you are saying is the negative 55 for only sodium ions? No, it's not for sodium ions. The negative 70 is the state of the inside of the cell. And I said that is created because of the different ionic composition in and out of the cell. Okay, so it's not only sodium. We have different differences in potassium. We have differences in chloride. We have differences in calcium. We have differences in um, magnesium, uh, phosphate, bicarbonate, all these ions, okay? There are differences in them. Aside that, I mentioned that the inside of the cell has some proteins that are negatively charged, okay? So when you mention the state of the inside of the cell, which is negative, it's referring to the nature of the, the, the inside of the cell, okay? The inside of the cell is negative 55, and it's not related to only sodium. The sodium is helping creating that environment. Potassium is helping creating that environment. And that is as a result of the difference in the, the concentration of sodium in and out. The difference in concentration of potassium in and out. You get it. And also the anions inside the cell, the proteins inside the cell, all are contributing to the neg negative environment inside the cell. Derek, are you okay? Hello? Hello? Hey, can you hear me, class? Yes, yes we, sister, can hear we can you. hear you. I can hear okay. you. All right. All right. All right. Any question for the day? And I think someone asked the question. Someone asked the question anyway. And the person, was it Samuel? Yes, yes, please. Abafa. Yes, come again with your question. Let's discuss. Yes, I was uh, trying to find the physiology behind uh, the hypocalcemia where she was sick and then the trozo sign where there will be twitching of, uh, wow. that's a genetic, where the why the patient do have that twitching when there is a hypocalcemia. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so um, any submissions or oh, my time is about uh, three minutes. Okay, let me just address it and let's move. So hypocalcemia, as I said, Cal uh, calcium is very necessary in movement. And the reason why it's very necessary in movement is at the muscular cell, at the basic cells of 
the muscles, okay? Before you can move your muscles, we have contraction happening. And before contraction would happen, calcium will move into the muscle cell. Just like how we mentioned calcium moving into the neuron for vesicles to be released. We also have calcium moving into the muscle cells for contraction to happen. So in the absence of calcium or in an, an environment where there's low calcium, okay, you will find this muscle twitch and you will find these conditions that we are mentioning. Okay, so hypocalor and um, hypo um, calcemia, right? Hypocalcemia yeah. is when you have low calcium levels. And that is, can be as a result of maybe that part of your body also not getting enough supply of blood. Okay, so if there's not enough blood, definitely um, the, the blood is also supplying, being an extracellular fluid could also exchange its calcium components with the interstitial fluid. Okay, so before you could get calcium into the muscle cells, the muscle cells should have supply of blood. Okay, and aside that also, we should have um, ATP. ATP is also another factor aside the calcium. So although you could have lower calcium levels, that could cause that muscle um, malfunctioning. ATP is also a major factor. So as we are moving ahead with the skeletal system, we talk about contraction. We talk about the importance of calcium in there. So without calcium, there can be no contraction. Without no contraction, even movement you can't do. You get it. So okay. at the basic level, at the muscular level, at the cellular level, calcium is very necessary for muscle um, contraction and movement. And therefore, lower concentration will cause all these abnormalities that we are talking about. I don't know if anyone has any addition. Thank you very much. You're yeah, welcome. Any other question? Madam, please, my hand is up. Hey. Okay, is it Irene? Yes, please. But I'm sorry, my network was bad, so I was going on, uh, on and off. All right, all right. So you are trying to get the audio to you. Okay, Madam, but I want to get one clarification, please. All right. I wanted to ask, so it means when the when the the uh, memory potential when it didn't reach or when the but I don't know the terms to like the negative fifty five when yeah. it didn't get to the threshold does it mean that the ion is at its resting memory potential? Okay, uh, can someone answer this question? Can someone answer this question before I come in? From your understanding of today's class, when the impulse doesn't reach the threshold, does that mean it's a resting memory potential class? Any submission? Yes, Mogdo. Yes, madam. Please, uh, you said that uh, when the, the value is a uh, it's not up to 70, not 70. It means that uh, the neuron is at work. And when it's also okay. more, okay, it's also at work. So it's only at 70 when it's at, when it's less. That's the threshold. But when it's above or below, it means that it's at work. All right. So, um, but can you, you, it's a good submission, but I think you still didn't ask. Irene is asking, when an impulse doesn't hit the threshold, which is negative 55, mm. does that mean it's still a resting memory potential? No, please. So what is it? That means, uh, I would say it's action, not uh, resting memory, please. Action. Yeah, that means it's still at work. Yes, it's at it's at work, but which um okay, okay. You it's fine. Any other 
submission. A graded potential. Yeah, graded potential. So that is graded potential. Okay. Irene, so when the impulse doesn't reach the threshold, that is okay. graded potential. Graded. Okay. Whenever yeah. it reaches the threshold, then it becomes an action potential, of which you talk about it next, next week. Okay. Thank you very much, Mother. Yes, Daniel, nothing. Daniel. Daniel, are you speaking? We can't hear you. If it's a network challenge, you can type your question in the chat box. Yeah, Williams, question. Um, submission. I wanted to answer or give a submission on the question asked earlier on the trouser style and the. Yeah, yeah. So, wait. Uh, we know that. Sorry. Uh, we, we know that with um, calcium, calcium helps with the uh, function of the transmission of impulses. And with low calcium levels in the body, it's going to disrupt the normal function of nerves and muscles. And when this happens, it's going to cause excitability and hyperactivity of the, of the cells. So when this happens, it results in muscle spasms and contractions yes oh. and we know that uh, with the treasure sign it is um involuntary contraction of the muscles in the hands and the ribs okay yeah so when then uh, the impulses at that um, area is uh, there's excitability and hyperactivity as a result of low calcium then you can have the treasure sign and with the um, the is it the Vostek sign? Is it Vostek? Yeah, yeah. So with that one, that one is the cheek twitching or twitching mm -hmm. in the cheek. Yeah. So that one, too, it follows the same mechanism where we have the increased excitability and hyperactivity due to the irregular. Uh, functioning of the nerves and the muscles because of the low calcium. And with that one, what happens is most of the times there's irritability in the facial nerve. Mm. So when there's irritability in the facial nerve, then you can have um, the twitching of the the cheek. And most of the times to when you have certain um, pressure or when you put pressure on the some part of the facial nerve or mm. most uh, most importantly the zygomatic arc mm. yes it's a, a bone that is found in that region when you do mm. that it's going to cause the face muscle to twitch yeah so okay. that is my understanding okay okay that's great that's a great submission so with this muzzle twitch, spasm, and then all the, the ones you are mentioning, we are going to address them, okay? And it's under muzzle physiology, we are going to do that after this. You tend to know that um, we have a junction called the neuromuscular junction, the neurons, and then the muscular, okay? We have neurotransmitters released at that junction to cause the transmission of impulse. And therefore, um, Calcium also is involved in the to continue the um, contraction, continued contraction, as I said. So always looking at the uh, emphasis with the basic physiology or the cell the cellular physiology level. You look at what is happening inside the cell before it expands to the tissue and then the organs. Okay. So as you move on, you talk more of muscle twitch, the titani, and then all that, and look at how it affects us. The components of um, the the components that are involved, the electrolytes and another chemicals involved, and where they fall short or they are too much, they are effect and all that. So let's take note of all this. 
Any other questions? Any other submissions? All right, so if there's no submission contribution, then we end the class. Oh, well, uh, Derek, uh, yeah, uh, Derek. Uh, Derek, all right. Derek, your hand is up, or well, there's no question. Uh, you made us to do some screenshot. I was trying to ask whether whether yeah, we are to answer yeah. it now. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you have a class after this? Do you have the class? Just you know, we have a class. We have a class. Let's discuss it before we start our class next week. So we discuss it at the beginning of our class. Yes, All right, please, by the close of the day, let me get the time that you want to do the message. The time, please. If I don't get the time, I'll fix my own time, please. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. And same to you. Thank you, right. sister. Right. Thank you very much. Have a blessed day. Bye bye. Yeah.